Hi, I'm Cheryl Belson with American Song Guild, and I just recently learned that November is Native American Heritage Month. Now, I wish I'd known this sooner because I would have loved to do a segment on this during the month of November, but we're doing it now, and I'm really excited about it. Um, the time that we celebrate the rich and diverse cultures and traditions and histories of the Native American people. And we take a moment to acknowledge the important contributions they've made. Well, since I also recently met one of our newest members in the Plano chapter, Debbie Baker, and I have learned of her personal pursuit to learn to draft traditional clothing from her Choctaw heritage, I immediately wanted to connect with her and capture her story. So Debbie, thank you for joining me today. Welcome. Halito and Yako Key, that is hello and thank you in Choctaw. And I can't tell you how much I appreciate the opportunity to share with you um, this journey that I've been on. Well, we can't wait to hear about it. And, you know, let's just dive right in. I'd love to hear a little bit about how your interest in learning to make authentic Native American apparel developed. So can you tell us a little bit about that? I can. So as a separate people group, um, the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma, we have about 220,000 tribal members. And it's really important that we maintain our culture, our heritage, our language, so that we continue to identify as that separate people group. It's very imperative that we continue to pass on all of those traditions and cultures to our to our um fellow tribal members. So, and there's a lot of that that goes along. There's our beading of jewelry, our traditional clothing, um, how we grow and prepare our heritage or heirloom foods um, to, you know, and most importantly is our language. So the, the journey started for me when I actually started working for the Choctaw Nation about six years ago. Every month, the first Monday of every month, we have what's called Heritage Day, where um, I see a lot of our tribal members dressed in our traditional clothing. They serve traditional foods. We do our social dancing. Um, we are taught some of our crafts. And getting to participate in that every month started this, this deep yearning inside that I want to connect more with my tribe. Up until that point, I hadn't had an opportunity to. Um, so I had actually commissioned, um, a, an elder in our tribe to, to, to make this shirt, this traditional shirt for me. And I'll just step back here so you can see it. I absolutely love it. Um, when I step into it, I, I, I almost just feel like the spirit of my heritage of my ancestors come to me. It's really, it's, it's kind of. It's incredible to think that a, just an article of clothing can can kind of bring that into you, and and it it really does. It it, it brings it to you. So um, you know, I had commissioned a elder to make this shirt, and the this shirt, and also one for my husband. So the men wear the traditional shirts also, and these shirts cost anywhere from two hundred or three hundred dollars each, which you might think sounds like a lot. I should tell you, a whole dress costs. $600 or more. And these are just the shirts. But as I explain to you the intricacies of what goes into making one of these, you'll be like, okay, I understand. So it can, it can take quite a few hours to make them. And a lot of that has to do with the, the details that have been added to it. Um, so after several months of, of wearing the shirt that had been commissioned, I really wanted to get to learn how to make my own. And there was one of our elders who was hosting a class. And the good thing is, at the time, I didn't know anything about sewing. I didn't know how to read a pattern. I didn't know how to use a machine. I grew up watching my mother and grandmother do these things. But I think just at some point around, around my teenage years, I veered off into another area. And so I didn't pick up those. Regrettably, I would love to have my grandmother back to sit to, next to her and sew every day. But um, so I had to learn from the very beginning, every little thing about sewing, the terminology, how to do it, the, the very basics. So what was really great about this class that the elder was hosting well, she encouraged us to use a pattern so that I felt 
more comfortable because these shirts or the, this clothing doesn't have traditional patterns. And, and I think we'll talk about that more a little bit later on. But um, uh, she encouraged us to to start where we could, which is good because, you know, not having some of those skills and then just embellish it with some of the Choctaw um Choctaw elements, which I'll talk about those later too, to kind of share with you what those mean. That's kind of where my journey began was just um, experiencing it firsthand, wearing the clothing at these heritage events and, and wanting to, to make more for myself. <laughs> that is quite a journey. I love that the uh, order of your journey is falling in love with the heritage first and wanting to sew second. It was like you you added the skill of sewing to meet this passion that you had in the heritage. So, and I now I understand that it, along the way that you have kind of researched and kind of gotten familiar with some of the apparel history that leads up to the period that you're most interested in because you have picked a period in time. Is that right, that you are interested right. in learning how to make, what to make? So tell us a little bit about the apparel history that leads up to that time. Yeah, so if you can imagine, probably when somebody mentions Native American tribes, you might have Pocahontas or something kind of stereotyped in your head. And truly, some of that did exist, uh, or it, it did. Um, we we made traditional clothing up until about the late 1700s, early 1800s, um, out of, of animal bones and hides and furs and, and, you know, fibers that, plant fibers that we may have woven together, um, river grasses, things like that. So um, there absolutely was a period of more, even more traditional clothing. But the one that I'm focused on is about the late 1700s, early 1800s, more when we had that colonial French influence to, um, to and started with cotton fabrics. Um, you know, so it, it changed over about, like I said, about the early 1800s, but you'll find that um, our Mississippi, because we were, we were transitioned from Mississippi to Oklahoma, and again, my tribe is the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma, but there's also a Choctaw Nation of Mississippi, and those are the ones that stayed in Mississippi after we came to Oklahoma, but they were still wearing the very traditional clothing um, up until the 16, 1960s, so you know, they, and, and they've actually been wonderful because they've maintained a lot of our culture that we lost coming to Oklahoma. We assimilated very quickly and changed our languages, our religion, our clothing, um, where the Mississippi tribe um, maintained a lot of our culture. And we rely on them a lot to go back and learn some of the traditional cooking, the traditional pottery, traditional clothing. So, um, you know, it's, it's a very tight relationship. We are still one tribe, but again, they still wore the clothing until the 60s, so not that long ago. Yeah. Um, so, and then there's two other fashions when we talk about, about the clothing. So the two fashions of clothing that um, we mostly know about is our everyday traditional wear, which is really these cotton dresses um, that uh, is very standard. And, we'll um, and then you have more of our regalia that's used for social dancing, which um, is typically what you see in a powwow type environment where they're wearing dresses that they call them jingle dresses because they have little jingles hanging from them. Um, but it's more of the celebration. So my focus right now is mostly on the everyday traditional clothing. I, um, I noticed on the picture you showed us that there's some consistent designs on several of those uh, garments. So is there some symbolism or something that is traditional that has those repeating on various garments? Yeah, absolutely. That's one of the things about um, Native American heritage is that you'll find everything means something. The, the symbols that we use, the, the everything that we do has some sort of deeper meaning and connection with the earth and, and, and what it all means. So here's a couple of those. And you'll even notice here on my shirt that we've got some of the diamonds and the lines. And so what the, the, 
sorry, I need to get it to where I can, I couldn't see myself on that one. So what the, the diamonds actually represent is the diamondback rattlesnake, which seems a little scary, right? <laughs> but yeah. as a tribe, we actually respect the diamondback rattlesnake for all that it does to protect our our gardens and keep the rodents out. We were an agricultural tribe, so we weren't, um, we were more of hunting in our local areas. We didn't travel and follow the buffalo around the Great Plains. We traditionally, even before being colonized, we were an agricultural tribe that grew corn and grew beans and grew squash like <laughs> um they call it a sweet potato squash it looks like a pumpkin but um so we we grew our own food but again the we respected everything all the elements out in nature and one of those was the diamondback rattlesnake and um you know we knew we were invading his environment when we when we came in so we respected them we respected turtles we you know everything about nature so again the the diamonds represent the diamondback rattlesnake so even if you ever have a chance to come to our cultural center or to our headquarters you'll see diamonds everywhere so the other thing is a half diamond and again when i talk about these embellishments it's usually what they do with the trim and you'll notice maybe in some of the other pictures or if you get a chance to explore out on facebook you'll see some different ones but so this one is called the half diamond. So what's happening is these lines are the road of somebody's path that they take. And so if you were to do half diamonds up and down the road, it means you've gone down the road to help somebody who was sick and you came back up the road when they were well. So this is your journey of your life that you're you're constructing the journey of your life onto your clothing. So one of the other ones is a circle. And again, these are my resources. Let me just point it out to you really quick. This is the Choctaw Music and Dance. Um, and it is a book that I have done some research on to try to, again, learn what some of these mean. Because again, I want to understand it. I don't want to just wear it. I want to know and I want to be able to talk to it. And I want to feel it when I'm wearing it, that it means something. So this circle so again, you would probably see circles instead of diamonds, or you might see the circles on the arms. Um, what the circle means is basically the circle of life that we don't want to gossip because if you gossip, it'll come back around to you. So you have a circle of life um, that <laughs> it reminds you not to not to gossip. So the last one is a cross, but not like. Um, a religious cross. It's it's a cross going this direction, an X really. Um, and it means two things. One, may our paths cross again, but it also means that um, stick ball, which is a traditional game that our, um, our men played that um, instead of going to war, because we couldn't afford to lose men, um, in, a, in a war, we would have these stickball games where they would, the winner of the game basically won the war. So if there was an argument over land or an argument over something, they would play these stick, and I say play, they're, they're quite violent because there's no rules. You know, it's, it's, um, it's football without padding. <laughs> um, so they, they're, they're very rough. Um, so it it was still a very, very tough game, but those often that that X can represent where somebody would come in from their stick ball game and hang their sticks up on the wall. So um, there's a lot of history and hair and uh, in, in description in the clothing that we wore. Those symbols are so interesting and the, the meaning behind the symbols is really interesting. Um, I'm curious, have you personally tried to make some of those designs yourself? I have. One of the elements that you do have to make is the diamonds and the bias tape. So um, you make yards and yards and yards of diamonds that are daisy chained together um, so that you can ultimately sew them in to the pattern. But, um, and again, I don't know if this will show, but you are cutting little inch by an inch and three quarters and you're folding it into the shape of the diamond and it, it seems simple enough but you get about halfway down and realize you have squares 
<laughs> instead of diamonds. So, and you have to iron each one and, and, you know, you, you eventually get a little bit better where you're pinning them together. It just, it takes lots of practice, but you'll think you're doing a great job and then you'll look at one and you're like, Hmm, no, that's about, those are all squares, not diamonds or trapezoids or some other shape that, that they're not supposed to be. So again, that's where I mentioned earlier that these, these shirts are quite expensive, but the effort that goes into making these perfect diamonds and then getting the bias tape perfectly lined up again, our roads, as we would call them. But um, yeah, it's, it just takes a lot of practice to get good at it. <laughs> well, I, I know that you're, you're so tenacious. I've already learned that about you. And so I know <laughs> people, uh, get there if you're not there already. Well, um, when you and I were talking earlier, uh, you mentioned that a lot of the stories of the Native American heritage have gone untold. Um, and that that was part of the challenge that you had in trying to develop your understanding of the apparel and how to to make your own. So can you tell us a little bit more about how those stories got lost? I can actually. So there's two significant reasons why those stories got lost. One, they're both significantly sad, but um, one of them is the, the assimilation policies of our federal government throughout the 1800s and the 1900s. They wanted to take the Native American tribes and, for lack of a better word, they assimilated them into the um, European cultures, um, whether that's through the religion or through the language or through the clothing. So they would um, literally go through and take children above five years of age, bring them into schools, take them away from their parents. They weren't allowed to speak their language. They weren't allowed to wear their clothes. And they would be punished significantly if they um, showed any of their culture or heritage. So it literally was stripped from many, many, many of the children. So many of our elders refused to, to share the culture with their children and grandchildren because they didn't want them to have to go through potentially some of those, those challenges that they did when that culture was stripped from them. Wow. So the other thing is um, a lot of, and you may have read about some of this, but a lot of the pandemics of, of you know, smallpox and, and flus and our, the native tribes weren't, we weren't conditioned to those types of, of pandemics and, and such. My great grandparents both passed away in 1918 during the flu pandemic and mm -hmm. um, and, and my grandmother, my Choctaw grandmother, was sent to go live with her non-Choctaw relatives. Granted, it's five miles away, but she wasn't brought up in that Choctaw heritage. And so traditionally, where you would expect to learn from your mother, who learned from her mother, who learned from their, grand, from their mother, um, I didn't get that experience. So I've had to literally... Um, hunt and peck and try to ask a lot of questions, attend a lot of events from the nation where somebody may be teaching some of these things. But again, it's still, it's, it's almost like this oppression, like people are still just shy of wanting to, to share it openly with everybody. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we have this renaissance going on where we're starting to feel okay, like it's okay to talk about that and we're okay to share that. But the problem is none of it was documented. So because of, of, you know, not wanting to hang on to those heritages or the assimilation policies, there's very little documentation. So, so most of what you've had to cobble together, it, you've had to actually yes. talk to elders and what, I mean, what a blessing that there are still elders available to share their knowledge with you since it's not documented. And I know you've had and the opportunity to sit down with them and hear them talk about how they made this clothing and help enlighten you. And that's, that's a, that is without that, where would you be? You know, I'll tell you one other struggle that exists. You have some elders who believe everything has to be very traditional. Like they want you to rip the cloth. They want you to hand sew everything. Um, and I have to kind of ask myself, 
I wonder if that elder in 1910 would use a sewing machine and some scissors if, you know, if they had been, been available, which I, I know sewing machines were available then. But the, the thing is, is like, I think they would have progressed. You know, they would have taken on some of the modern technologies that were available to them. And trust me, I think that there is something core to your heart of, of doing it in a traditional style, you know, ripping and, and hand sewing. And, and I think that, you know, it's too much for somebody who's beginning like myself, but I think maybe 10 years from now, when I have more time and more effort and more experience, it may be a direction I want to go. So you've got those elders that unless you're doing it the traditional way, then you shouldn't be doing it. Yeah. But then you have the ones who are a little bit more accepting of, like I said, the one that I took the class from when I made this shirt. This is just a standard, oh, I don't know, Simplicity or McCall's or something, you know, pattern that has like a bell sleeve and it's, do not look at, this was my very first thing to ever sew. You know, I'm like it looking at it great. going, oh my gosh. <laughs> it looks fantastic. But, uh, you know, so, you know, that they're okay with you taking a standard paper pattern um, and embellishing it. So I think it's a good step of bringing people to accepting, yes, we have our traditions. Yes, we have our heritage, but it's 2020. We also need to bring it forward. It's okay to take a beautiful suit that fits like a 19 or a 2020 suit and put some diamonds on it, you know, make it look more, um, put some of those traditional elements on it. So that, that particular shirt, your first attempt on your own, you said you based that on a, a one of the big four patterns. And I am interested, uh, I think our, our viewers will be interested to hear you tell the story you told me about the pattern you got from talking to the elders, it's a little less traditional than a uh, pattern that you get out of an envelope at Joanne's. Yeah, absolutely. Had this been what I got handed the first time I went into a class, I probably would have taken off and left because it's just so overwhelming, um, not knowing how to draft pattern pieces. But Asian, there have been a few elders that have tried to cobble together enough information that somebody with a good baseline of pattern drafting and sewing and, and construction could figure out how to do that. But somebody as myself who doesn't have all of those traditional um, skill sets have had to go in and learn them. So, um, yeah, I provided you a copy of that uh, that PDF and most of it's handwritten. Um, and, and it's, it, it's a lot of take your measurements, cut out a rectangle, do a U for the net. You know, I mean, it's, it's, um, stuff that, you know, you, somebody that's a very experienced sewer would know, um, how to, how to divide up and quarter up different pieces of the pattern. Whereas myself, I wouldn't understand what, you know, how to do those. So anyway, um, it, it's been, um, and unfortunately, I made my shirt back in November of 2019 okay. with the goal of there being a class making or a dress making class. Then, of course, the pandemic hit. So we've we've all kind of come to a screeching halt. But that's been good in some ways because it's let me take a step back and really absorb that um, the information that was provided from the elders and then kind of go back and maybe take a pattern making class and you'll find that it's just a long circle skirt or something along those lines so I can learn from the information that was provided and in all honesty my goal would be to draft a digital pattern that maybe has some measurement coordinates on it that I can eventually publish and give to more of my um, fellow tribal members so that they have an opportunity to, to make these dresses themselves. This is, it's different. It's not like I need to make a pattern and hoard it for myself so that nobody ever learns it. And sometimes I think there is a little bit of that with, with, mm -hmm our elders. That's my recipe. <laughs> I'm not going to give you my, my famous cookie recipe kind of thing. And, and whether it's, I don't think it's intentional by any means, but we all have the grandmother who doesn't want to share the recipe and you may get it on the deathbed kind of thing. But, you know, um, I'm hoping that I can open some more doors for, for some of my, um, 
my generation of the tribe, tribal members, that we can learn how to make those and provide more traditional patterns or digital patterns so that they can make them. Well, I think that uh, you're just the person to do that. <laughs> so you're we'll see. You definitely <laughs> have here. Yeah. Um, so before we close, I, I want to just take a, a second to hear about a non-sewing part of your journey into your heritage. Um, I understand that you've also been working to learn the language. So can you tell us just a little bit about that? Now, I have been learning. I spent two years now in our language classes um, and not being a, I'm a numbers person, so languages don't come easily to me. And so it's been a challenge, but it's been so worthy because, again, it's another way to connect with with my heritage. And as I mentioned before, it's imperative that we have um, we have tribal members that speak our language. Again, that identifies us with who we are in our culture and says we are a separate people group. We haven't just completely blended in with the the rest of the people groups that are out there. Um, so yeah, I've spent two, two years. Um, I spent about six hours a week on, on, yeah, it's, it's very difficult. Um, but, uh, let me see if I can think of a few things maybe to say. Um, Chihololi is, I love you. Um, Chapintalachiki is, I'll see you later. Again, we don't traditionally say goodbye. We'll say, I'll see you later. Um, let's say see. that one again. Uh, Chapintalachiki. Chapintalachiki. Yeah, good job. <laughs> So, um, and again, because of the language not being some of the traditional things that I grew up hearing, like Spanish, growing up in Texas, I heard that a lot. Um, I'm not used to some of the vowel sounds um, and some of the unique sounds that our language makes. So they don't, my tongue <laughs> doesn't traditionally, I think whenever I try to speak to an elder, they're like, mm, yeah, you got a lot of Southern draw, <laughs> a little Oklahoma in that in that uh, um, speech, but yeah, it's it's been another way to connect and I've really appreciated that the nation um, offers those classes to us. Well, that is fantastic. I know that you'll progress in that as well. So Debbie, thank you so much for joining me today and telling me about all of this. I've learned so much and I'm sure that our viewers will learn so much also. Um, we're really grateful to have you in our chapter and I truly do look forward to watching you progress in this pursuit to make your uh, culturally heritage apparel. And uh, what a wonderful way to reflect on this as we come, as we we reflect back on Native American Heritage Month. And uh, I can't wait to see what comes next from your journey. Wow, Cheryl, thank you so much for inviting me. I think again. Um, it's so important that we continue to educate people on every type of ethnic group that's that's out there, that we all respect each other, that we honor each other. I appreciate that you want to learn about who we are and what we are and what it means to us. Well, I'm going to do my best effort to say farewell <laughs> in Bokta. So, Chapintalachiki. Very close. Uh, Pintalachiki. So to get those, those nasalized L's, they're or nasalized N's, they're, they're difficult when you're not used to saying them, but Chapintalachiki. Chapintalachiki. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye now. Bye.